is the 10th anniversary uh, of the Global Internet Governance Forum, uh, and it's going to be hosted in Brazil in November, so that's another reason to hold on to your jobs, uh, where we will look back on the last 10 years of the uh, IGF. Uh, so uh, quite a lot of people in this room were there in 2005 at the conclusion of the World Summit on the Information Society, the WISIS in Tunis, uh, where the concept of a multi-stakeholder internet, internet governance forum as a uh, place for broad-based broad -based discussion involving a wide range of different stakeholders uh, was formed, and it was seen as a sort of experimental or radical idea. Few people thought it might never take off. Some people thought it would just uh, become a talking shop that achieved little and fizzled out. Uh, and m a lot of people assumed that the UN would gradually take over. Uh, and 10 years on, it seems inconceivable that I think the, uh, the mark of the success of what happened in 2005 is that 10 years on in 2015, uh, we probably now think it's inconceivable that we didn't have a forum uh, that brought people together for constructive debate, gave them the opportunity to share information, uh, and brought together the range of different stakeholders that are here today at the UK IGF. Obviously, representatives of business, but also, obviously, equally importantly, civil society, the technical community, politicians, uh, and academics. Uh, and it says here, my own government policy experts who are obviously the most important. Um, you work together as people best equipped to advocate the best practices, seize the opportunities, resolve the problems, and set the future direction of the internet. And I also think the track record of the last 10 years demonstrates that this open and inclusive multi-stakeholder approach is the one that best promotes innovation, and it creates the economic and social opportunities in step with the very rapid technology changes that are transforming our economy and our way of life. So this is the model of the governance of the internet that we're going to defend in the UN in New York later this year, when the implementation of the outcomes of the 2005 WISIS review will be looked at. And the review will cover many areas of action to extend the information society to as many people as possible and to ensure that information and communication technology contributes to sustainable development. There's a huge amount of work still to be done, of course, to bridge that digital divide, and we hope that the WISIS agenda for 2016 onwards will focus on that. Uh, on the issue of processes and mechanisms, I think we can reflect on how the IGF concept has not only succeeded, I think, in achieving the ambitions set for it in 2005, but also how it's been embedded at many different levels. Because, of course, in addition to the global IGF, we also have regional fora uh, and we also have national fora. And, of course, the UK IGF was one of the first national IGFs in 2008. And since then, there's been a proliferation of similar national processes and multi-stakeholder events. And we in the UK always saw the UK IGF uh, as being a process that would uh, link people up, have events, uh, provide networking opportunities, and the opportunity to share experiences uh, and ideas. And in fact, the UK IGF was originally conceived as giving the opportunity both for UK stakeholders to come together, gearing up for the annual global IGF, but also for UK stakeholders to then disseminate what emerged from the UK IGF to the wider UK community. And this year, more than in previous years, these link-ups have been reinforced as part of the overall strengthening of the IGF. And the theme of the global IGF this year, as you know, is the evolution of internet governance, empowering sustainable development. And linked to this is a call for inputs from national and regional IGFs on policy options on how to connect the next billion people. There's also, of course, the opportunity for UK stakeholders to contribute to a lot of different forums in Brazil, uh, there'll be issues such as combating spam, there'll be uh, IPv6 transition, uh, establishing C-certs, computer security incident response teams, uh, and also enhancing multi-stakeholder mechanisms 
such as advisory groups working at the heart of government policy formulation. Uh, and that's an approach that you'll hear today in one of the workshop sessions uh, that, is adopted, uh, that we've adopted with our multi-stakeholder advisory group on internet governance, the MAGI. And the WISIS Plus 10 review in the UN is one of two major developments that's going to <coughs> uh, be the focus for the internet community this year. And the other, of course, is the IANA stewardship transition uh, and the future of ICANN's operation of functions relating to the root zone, the top level of the domain name system. Currently performed, as you know, <coughs> by ICANN under contract to the US government. This is all changing, of course, and in what is the final key step in globalizing the coordination of the domain name system. And it's a process that I've supported fully since it got underway. ICANN was asked by the U.S. government's National Telecommunications and Information Administration uh, just over a year ago to set up a multi-stakeholder process to devise a new architecture of oversight, management, independent review and accountability for the IANA functions. How has this uh, process gone? I think, uh, again, the answer has exceeded our expectations. The response by stakeholders who have volunteered their time to help develop the proposal has been absolutely fantastic. And also I applaud the two <coughs> co-chairs of the process, particularly concerning the especially complex IANA naming functions. They're Jonathan Robinson, who's the executive chairman of the domain name registry Affilias, and Lisa Fur of the Danish Internet Forum. There's a hugely complex range of issues surrounding the naming functions, and this part of the process has obviously taken longer than perhaps originally envisaged. But Jonathan and Lisa have na navigated the complexities, they've marshaled the inputs, the ideas, they've suggested solutions with a great deal of diligence and effectiveness over the last year, and of course it has been a very, very tight timeline. And they and members of their cross-community working group have done a tremendous job in producing a single proposal for transition, and I know that Nominet is closely involved in this crucial process as well. The proposal has just been published, and we discussed at the ICANN public, uh, and it's going to be discussed at the ICANN public meeting next week in Buenos Aires. So the process, as I said, is taking slightly longer than envisaged, but it is broadly still on track. I don't think governments working together, by the way, could have done so much in such a tight time frame. Uh, I think this whole process has yet again shown how the multi-stakeholder approach of bringing people together, bringing experts from all quarters, not just government, business, civil society, the technical experts, can actually achieve concrete results very quickly and very effectively. So it's actually a model that we could adopt in many different areas. I've talked a lot about the global context uh, uh, within which this meeting of the UK IGF sits, and I didn't want to talk a little at the end of my speech about our own priorities for national internet policy. Uh, as you know, we're engaged at the moment in building out the UK's digital infrastructure. We want to build broadband uh, out so that as many people as possible have access to super fast speeds. We want that to be complemented by much broader mobile coverage. We want to educate our uh, young citizens, uh, children at school, uh, in coding, uh, and we want to give people the skills to take part in the digital economy uh, that the internet makes possible. We want to combat digital exclusion. We want as many people as possible to be able to get online uh, in the UK as well. We've also obviously focused as well on uh, protecting children uh, on the internet. So we've pioneered, uh, along with organisations like Nominet and obviously the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, the kind of child safety measures that make a big difference. We set up, the last uh, Labour government set up the UK Council for Child Internet Safety, which has been a fantastic organisation to push forward self-regulatory approaches. And again, another example of a forum that brings together <coughs> expertise from a wide uh, range of people. So I know that you're going to have a session today with the Internet uh, Watch Foundation that's going to look at what's happened since the We Protect Summit. 
and will consider the role and responsibilities of all the relevant actors in a global multi-stakeholder environment. The other big domestic policy issue, as it were, that is uh, actually taking place at a European level is the issue of net neutrality. Uh, as you know, a net neutrality directive forms part of the telecom singles market package, and we've ne been negotiating with the Commission, the European Parliament, and other member states on this for <coughs> nearly two years. I think net neutrality is a more controversial subject than perhaps uh, some people think. Some people think net neutrality is motherhood uh, and apple pie, but it's very important, I think, to get the balance right between ensuring that we have an open internet and ensuring uh, that telecoms companies can invest in their infrastructure and also that the market has room uh, to innovate. But we pioneered in the UK a code of conduct on net neutrality, which I'm pleased to say now uh, all the telcos and mobile, op major telcos and operators mobile operators have signed up to. <clears throat> I like to think that that code of conduct helped form the basis for uh, the proposed European uh, directive. Uh, but net neutrality is important and it's important to many uh, of our, many of the member states uh, in the European uh, Union who have perhaps different but no less valid reasons for wanting to see uh, net neutrality uh, taken forward. Uh, but it is also important, I think, to uh, be aware of uh, the occasional downside to what we're negotiating. Uh, and we have fought uh, absolutely to ensure that there's room for innovation, uh, absolutely that there's room uh, for consumers, consumer protection, uh, as well as the opportunity for regulators to intervene where necessary. <coughs> and most importantly, that the Net Neutrality Directive doesn't inadvertently, uh, in my view, push back uh, some of the pioneering child protection policies that we've put in place in the UK. But I'm confident that my uh, fellow ministers and fellow parliamentarians in other member states will listen uh, to our concerns because they know that fundamentally uh, our heart is in the right place as far as net neutrality uh, is concerned. I wish everyone here uh, an enjoyable rest of the day. It's uh, thoroughly good to be here. It's very nice to see uh, some old friends in the room. And it's nice to know, for example, uh, particularly to see Malcolm Harbour demonstrating there is life after politics. <laughs> I, I look to you, Malcolm, as my inspiration <laughs> for when, uh, when things don't go as well as they did a few months ago. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>